Well, good evening all, and it's a great pleasure to be out of the house. <laughs> all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Hey, no need to ring the bell. It's just good. Yeah. Um, look, okay, this is the first time I've been in the city for, for some months, and um, but it's interesting. You know, I was sitting at home this afternoon watching the Democrat uh, convention on CNN, and um, whilst there was these the the demonising structurally of Donald Trump and what he's done to the, to the United States. There was also the eulogising of the American dream, of American exceptionalism. When, at a time when the, the, that nation is 4% of the world's population, is 25% of the coronavirus cases, and a large proportion, proportion of dead people. Um, and hasn't capitalism worked well in the United States? Um, so I was sort of driving in tonight, I live up on, on the beautiful Hawksby River up, up near Brooklyn and I was coming in tonight, came down the freeway and going past the, um, these magnificent towers of glass and steel, uh, these ever increasing blocks of flats going up down the Pacific Highway and uh, James Packer's, I don't know how, well I could describe it, but he's monument, it, uh, yeah. Uh, hanging off the edge of the harbour, um, all of it unoccupied, uh, all in the, the, the need to sort of sell and grow and, and gain more and more and more and more. And it, it sort of occurred to me that you know, capitalism, no, no, the batteries are yeah. is, is based on a few people winning, but the majority is going to lose. And, and I was casting around, reflecting on this with a mate of mine who lives in, in Ireland. Colin Regan, and he, he sent me something to say, well, you know, even the way that we're dealing with the pandemic, it's, it's divided into winners and losers. And he sent me this the other day. He said, consider this. In Malawi at the moment, fewer than 50 people a day can get tested for the virus. They have less than 25 intensive care unit beds. Very few ventilators in a country with a population of more than 18 million. Zambia currently has one doctor for every 10,000 people. Mali has a mere three ventilators per million people. And he thought, you know, given the capacity that exists in Europe and North America and countries like this, think, if we're all in this together, like we've been saying, we're all in this together. Well, actually, no, we're not. And it's made possible that, that we're not because of the capitalist system globally that says some are in, but most are out. And he, he sent me a copy of his book, which is available in all the bookstores in Dublin, he tells me. Um, describing the outflow of resources, this is no use to Pat, but the outflow of resources from the, the third world or the developing world to the developed world has a, a net loss every year of $58 billion. But the world donates $103 30 billion dollars to Africa every year, but it pulls out 192. And then here's the irony. The Africa is coping a lot better with the coronavirus than the United States is. So is this the end of global capitalism? I think the jury's out because there's more work to be done. But it is interesting to note, even before the coronavirus, the United Nations and the governments of Scandinavia were preparing for the end of capitalism because of the climate change and its inability to cope with climate change. Um, as we've seen, you know, again in the United States, the way that they, even in Barack Obama's time, I, I, I went to the cops, every cop I've been to in since the Copenhagen. Yeah. And the, the Americans would always come in at the last minute and try to cut everything. Uh, there'd be a coalition for the previous two weeks of the, the that seventy-five percent of the world's countries, and at the very last minute, the Yanks would come in and try and tighten it and straighten it and shorten it and diminish it until Trump came in and tore the whole thing up. But we were heading in that trend anyway. This was a, a system that was not able to sustain uh, gaining or sharing the the largesse of the world with the world. And it's interesting to note, that there was a great piece in Rolling Stone the other day, and they saw about the unraveling of America. Yeah. Well, they talked about, you know, the fact that um, the United States, in its 242 years of existence as the leader of this system, has only had 16 years when it hasn't been at war. 
So after the Second World War, the United States never stood down. And so at the same time, the Chinese have been pouring more you know, cement and building things. And you know, we can criticise a lot of what China is doing, but it was a different focus. The interesting thing I think about capitalism and in that context is that you know, the United States at the beginning of the Second World War was not heavily militarised, but pretty quickly, pretty soon, they were pumping out fighter jets by the hour, 18 million people serving. And yet today, in 2020, they can't produce enough paper face masks and cotton swabs to deal with the virus. Now, if that's not a system that's decidedly unhealthy, I don't know what is. So you've got the outflow resources from the, from the poor to the rich on a massive scale. You've got the increasing militarisation to maintain it. Um, and I remember seeing that in, in Kabul, one of my many trips to, to Afghanistan, uh, standing in outside the Indian consulate, which was blown up the next week, meeting some American soldiers who were guarding the, the embassy. Uh, these young guys came up and you know, they said, uh, they're very aggressive, they said, where are you from? And I said, um, and I said where are you from? And he said, uh, I'm from America. And they said, oh, wait, what, Peru? Chile? Oh, <laughs> El, El Salvador, you know? No, United States, oh, okay, all right, I'm from Australia. Um, but he was 19. He was 19. And, and, and you know, the fact that they, this is the longest war that we too have been engaged in. Because we've basically, as a nation, swallowed hook, line and sinker that capitalist ideology. It hasn't that worked well for us in the coronavirus in lots of ways. And I was reminded by that <laughs> sage prophet Bill Shorten on Insiders on Sunday looking at the catastrophe that aged care has become and basically said, if you're going to run aged care, you can't run it for profit and then say you're running it for care. And I think one of the lasting legacies of John Howard uh, and his rape of this nation's social systems was to privatise the care for the old. Because what we're seeing in Victoria is those chickens coming home to roost. And we see that across the board. You know, child care. Uh, in this country, well, you know, when we hit the crisis, well, the capital system can't deliver. We're going to have to pay for it centrally. And the, which also enables women to get back into the workforce. Um, it seems to me that this increasing, creeping Americanization and capitalist system that excludes titans and straightens to put more wealth into the hands of the few is something that we've, we've seen enough of. Um, and and, and, and you know, there's a language that came with it that I find alienating. You know, if you, if you go back 50 years or so, we, we all assume that we live together in a society. And if you live in a society, you're a citizen. But I guess through the Thatcher Reagan years, when the, what's that, what did Margaret Thatcher say very famously? You know, there's, no, I'll tell you. Well, there's no such thing as society, there's only individuals. And the language came with it to accompany it. It said, you know, oh, well, um, if you work or reside in a psychological institution in New South Wales, by the head of the parliament, we no longer call these people patients or residents, we call them clients. If you go to a bank, they, they sell products, they don't provide services anymore. So you take the hum human the human out of it. When you were used to fly on planes, if you listen to the overhead announcement, we were, you know, we were customers flying to Melbourne, we were no longer passengers. So there was a shift. And, and it manifested itself in my head about two years ago when I had to speak to an educational conference. And they were all sitting in their suits and ties, getting ready to depart on a Friday afternoon. The social justice human rights bike gets on a quarter past three on a Friday, right? And so they're all ready to go to get their taxis. And, and the bloke on before me was from San Diego. And he gets up and he goes, you know, it's really important that you people understand in education, you've got to deliver, you absolutely got to deliver a fair return on the investment of your client. You've got to make sure they're getting a fair dividend in this enterprise you're running here. And I got up and I sort of thought, I'm going to have a shot at this. And I said, I don't know, but I think he was talking about parents and their children. Because I think what the capitalist system has done increasingly has reduced humanity to its economic cost. 
You know, so where sits the Aboriginal child? Where sits the gay teenager in a country town? Where sits the old person in a nursing home in the middle of a pandemic? That's where the capitalist system is dying. It cannot deliver to those people. Yes, it will deliver to James Packer, who's the beautiful system over here. The magnificent, go for it, James. Yes, it will deliver to Alan Jones. But it won't deliver to the kids sitting in the dust of Balga who want a fair shake in their own country and can't be seen. That's where it misses out. And once we reduce the relationships into a society as to an economic value only, then I think we're heading down a very, very slippery path, which means, ultimately, we need to pillage the Earth's resources, which leads to climate change, to simplify it massively. And as the Pope, that well-known left-wing bomb-throwing liberal, said recently in his treatise on the Amazon, that we have so denuded and lost our relationship with the Earth that it, will give, it has given rise to this pandemic. So the link between climate change, which was a big threat to capitalism, had manifested itself now in this COVID-19 that is everywhere. That is truly global. And it's manifesting its hurt in places where the capitalist system said people don't count because they come second to profit. So what's the way out? And then I'll get off. Um, it's, <laughs> uh, it seems to me we have some work to do. Um, you know, Martin Luther King used to say forever and ever and ever and ever that the arc of history is long but it bends towards justice. Now what he didn't say is that these people to do the bending. And it seems to me that we, yes, we've seen in the last 50 years strong and powerful movements to claim the humanity back. You know, if you said 150 years ago that women, women would get the vote, no one would believe you. If you said that 50 years ago that apartheid would end in South Africa, no one would believe you. If you said that there would be an anti nuclear movement, that there would be environmental movements, and that the, the lead singer of Midnight Oil be a minister. Not necessarily a great one, but you're getting a bit. Mm. So it might be a black man in the White House, not necessarily doing great things all the time, but you get my point. Change does happen, but it needs people to mobilise and move for it to happen. I think that's the cusp of what we sit on here. The COVID-19 situation is not just a health emergency, it's an economic crisis because the economics we have been following only serve a few. And when you can't properly look after your old people, when you can't properly afford to care for your children, it seems to me that is a system that's on the way up. And we know that because it cannot cope with climate change. It cannot cope with the pandemic. Job keeper and job seeker is an issue. The capitalist theory goes out the window as soon as we need to look after our people. But the winding back, that's something we can do about, I think. And so there's, I guess my call tonight is that we need to have a movement um, calling on people of the progressive movement to, to refine the voice, join with others, including them, with those with whom we most disagree. Because at the moment, it would seem like they might be listening. So, we're all in this together? No, we're not. The way out of this is for most of us to be together in confronting a system that's broken. But it's not dead yet. Okay, well look, as one of the elderly people whom Phil is going to care for better in the future. Um, <laughs> I, you too, brother. No, really. I'm pleased to be on the same uh, platform as Phil. I'm going to um, say something brief, only briefly about the demise of capitalism, but mostly struggle with the uh, alternatives. In some ways, a sort of echo of what uh, Frank and Dan uh, started on um, last week. Uh, I see capitalism as a sort of aggressive competition uh, to fit uh, everybody into particular sections of society, to encourage them to try to get ahead or at least to avoid falling behind. And the techniques to do that have been concerned with the notion that uh, governments should be as small as possible, should not uh, intervene if at all possible, except, of course, to uh, promote privatisation and to protect corporate interests. So government 
does intervene under those circumstances. The other mechanisms of cons being concerned with uh, the terminology of the consequences of deregulation or the notion that <coughs> uh, everybody is really a commodity. To, uh, you bargain for your life in different marketplaces. It might be over childcare, increasingly, unfortunately, it's in um, healthcare and hospitals, and it's certainly in the um, commercialization of, of universities. And, and the consequences are there are the indices uh, are obvious in Australia, and they are very glaringly obvious uh, overseas, as, as Phil has indicated. Uh, if you look at the suicide rates, if you look at the incidence of mental illness, if you look at the extent of homelessness, if you look at the notion that young people do not expect to have a secure job um, uh, or, um, or access, or certainly in any easy access to housing. That's part of the pathology of, the, of this way of thinking and living. But unfortunately, as one of uh, Frank's good colleagues has, has often said, John Quiggin, it's become taken for granted. The particular version of capitalism that we've lived with for the past 20 years, usually labelled as neoliberalism, mm. has been taken for granted. So when you, when you even talk to young people, they can't fathom, they can't, it's very difficult for them to fathom an alternative. And when I've been to the United States, the idea that they could think of an alternative way of living despite the catastrophe they are experiencing now, uh, it, it is uh, very, it is very difficult. And there are two phenomena that have made um, that way of thinking and living um, uh, almost impossible in the future to achieve. And um, Phil has mentioned them. one, of course, is the uh, deliberate destruction of the planet on the assumption that we could um, accumulate and consume and reproduce as much as possible. And I'm re reminded of, you remember Mr. Creosote in Life of Brian when he ate so much and he exploded. Sure. So, um, and I remember sitting in my, one of my favorite cafes watching people at the beginning of the pandemic staggering out with trolleys full of toilet rolls. It yeah, was yeah. another, a, a form of um, overconsumption. They weren't edible. Um, and then of course the other, the other um, catastrophe that's um, that's um, made even the Morrison government and the Johnson government th think at least about emergency measures. They're not talking about an alternative to capitalism. They're talking about emergency measures. And it's the arrival of the, uh, the COVID-19 um, virus, which has destroyed people and economies and, um, is, a and it's, it's prompting terminology like um, uh, uh, like, <laughs> unfortunately, a return to normal. And the biggest danger is the assumption that the arrival of a vaccine will produce a return to normal. That is a complete delusion, and we have a responsibility to express what the alternative is. So that's, that's the next uh, struggle I'm going to have in the next two or three minutes. Um, because I think the terminology we use in talking about the alternative is, in, is very, very important the language we use to create some kind of vision about a different way of thinking and living is crucial. Uh, Frank and Dan uh, started that process last week. They referred to uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, the massive energetic visionary commitment to all sorts of collective uh, interests, almost completely at variance with the, with the um, energetic selfishness that characterizes current America. Um, that New Deal has been converted in a way into the Green New Deal, and uh, our wonderful friend Juliette Bennett talks about the ecologically sustainable society in, in kind of imitation of Frank's last week prescription about um, jobs, 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 nature, nature, nature. In other words, you can't talk about one without, uh, without the other. I want to talk about the interdependent society, but, but I also want to risk the word socialism. Because it is about, and I, I, it's the fear, there's a great deal of fear to use the alternative language, to talk about what the alternative is for, fe for fear that the Daily Telegraph will feature you on the front page, or that 
Sky News will, will have a go at you. I mean, we're simply talking about the ownership of certain means of production and a dispersal of power. Well, I'm going to come to the issue of power in a minute because I think it's a dispersal of power among people. And um, a most important of all in R.H. Tawney's notion, the notion of fellowship, a community of fellowship between people. Look how important that is in the current concern to, um, to, uh, to deal with, uh, with, with, the, um, with the predicament of people in uh, care homes. There, there are about three other, before we get, before we come to be certain about this vision, I mean, we do have to decide whether we're building a giraffe or a, or a, or a jet plane. In other words, what, and I don't think the new, the new way of thinking is going to be achieved merely by the aggregate of emergency measures. You know, add job keeper to job seeker to the pandemic um, wage. There are three things that concern me about, about this, the alternative. One is to be clear about the nature of democracy. We're actually fighting about democracy. Nancy McLean, American political scientist, wrote in a book called Democracy and Change, you cannot have unfettered capitalism and democracy. You have to choose one or the other. And a similar thesis was written by that wonderful thinker and writer Tony Jatt in a book called Ill Fares the Land. And it, he, he, he begged us to use criteria about policies as to whether, not whether they magnify profit or increase the well-being of shareholders or contributed to growth but was it was it just was a policy just was it in the the fair interests of all so um does that keep pinging because i'm talking too much no i'm great um, it's just your um so the implication of what i'm saying is that we have to beware the opposition to what we're thinking. We have to build, we have to think about opposition to the growing authoritarianism, to the growing fascism, to the notion that human rights and democracy are really, have had their time and they're really irrelevant. That, that is a very great danger. You don't have to think just of that appalling march in Charlottesville a few months ago. Hundreds and hundreds of men with burning torches remember that because it's it's here as well I, I you know the the abuse I get on, on over the Palestinian issue is, is, is daily yeah. um, and I mean I was told you today not even I'm not even, no. not even so I'm merely saying let's let's um, consider uh, consider that let me have a go um, at putting some uh, flesh on the skeleton of the interdependent society. This is more difficult. And my cop out is going to be that there really isn't time enough to describe the policies in detail. Um, but I take the notion of work. I'm a bit cautious when I hear economists saying we want to return to full employment. Almost, almost too easily. I think that recommendation has to be qualified with a concern to redefine what we understand by work for several reasons. One is if you look at the 1.8 million people on, on the job seeker, that mostly young people, and then you realize that there are 130,000 jobs listed as available at the moment, you can see a huge mismatch. The other concern is that there are all sorts of surveys that indicate that large a large percentage of the population, certainly the one I saw in Britain about six months ago, shows that 40% of the people think the work they do is pointless, monumentally boring, and they cannot wait to retire in order to do something useful with their lives. So, we, hmm? well, yeah. so the notion of the interdependent society is about doing something useful with your life. And I want to... Um, the, the, um, the, my concern with work is that we, we, we have to talk about, you can't talk about work unless you also talk about income. Um, and really that's, a, that's the basis for, for, for recommending talking about 
uh, advocating the universal basic income. Yeah, yeah. If, if, you add, if you add up, I'm not very good at adding up, I would never have got through first year economics. Um, if, but if you add up job keeper and job seeker and, and the pandemic um, uh, um, uh, proposed wage, it amounts to the universal ba a universal basic income. But, but there is a dreadful fear to, to talk about it. There's a dread I've noticed that even, even our political economy colleagues use different words to describe the universal basic income. It's not as contagious as the word socialism, but, but there's a kind of fear to express openly and with it, uh, well, the, the alternative that we're, that we're um, uh, re referring to. Now, I want to cut, I want to do two more things and then I'll finish, I think, on time. Pat. The first is to imagine what a young person aged 25 would say about their life in a contemporary neoliberal society. Because we have to, we have to think about uh, the people who are going to carry the banner, most of whom are quite a lot younger than those of us here. And I'm also going to try to speculate on what the, what the 25 year old in the in socially interdependent society See, even I've been trying to call it socialism, would, would, would say. The first person, I, and I talked to a taxi driver tonight, they said, look, I, I, I feel incredibly uncertain about the future. I don't really have much hope. I expect to have to live with my parents for much, for much uh, longer than I, <clears throat> than, I, um, than I want to. I've been told that, I, that in order to, to get ahead, I might buy some stocks and shares and hope that the stock exchange uh, gives me a break. And um, I, I really, by myself, I do have a lot of friends, but almost all of them are on Facebook and I, I've never met any of them. So, uh, but the, the, the essential message is uncertainty without hope, and, um, but with the notion that individual striving is the only way to uh, not only to hang on to the cliff, but to climb above it. And I want to stereotype the second person in, in our interdependent society who says, look, I've only got a job for three or four days a week, but, it, it's, but I do have the universal basic income, and I contribute to community activities which are enormously rewarding, some of which I get paid for. I, I've learned a great deal about... Um, uh, among my friends, I don't, I don't spend much time on a keyboard or looking at a script, the screen. I've learned a lot about the common good. That's really, uh, really uh, imperative for me, imperative for my friends. And uh, there is a paradox in, in my commitment to the local common good. And it, I know that it has to be linked to. Uh, an international view of the world. I cannot, we cannot have this nationalist parochialism. I realize how dangerous that is. So I, 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 I'm playing with this idea. We need, to, we need the, the, the citizens of, this, of these alternative societies to be able to say what, they, what their self image is. Okay, the last thing I'm going to say concerns concerns something I feel very strongly about, and it's about the, the, the abuse of power. The notion of uh, the use of violence, really, as a way to solve problems and get things done. I do not think that um, neoliberalism is the complete explanation for all the massive social and economic inequalities that we face. Over centuries, the, uh, the fascination almost entirely by men with the abuse of use, abusive use of power to get their way, to dominate, and to seek and to refuse to hear the alternatives has been a centerpiece of policy unacknowledged. You only have to look at, and the images go on all the time. I think, of, think of Mrs. Thatcher's use of armed forces and armed police to crush the miners. 
Think of the arrival of, um, of the AFP and ASIO to raid the offices of, um, of, of journalists in, in this country. We don't have to think of Belarus or, or the behavior of the, of the young men dressed up as some um, futuristic cops in Hong Kong. But the, 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 the fascination with the taken for granted assumption that violence is the way to solve problems has to be entered into the economic equations. Because otherwise I can't explain, I can't explain why why a system that is so unpalatable in, uh, that, uh, to, to so many um, is, obliges people to live in fear because otherwise the cops will come in. You only have to look at 70 pieces of anti-terrorist legislation which are in, almost entirely secret and unknown to most members of the, of the, um, of the um, Australian public. There is a political scientist in, um, in um, California who started writing about Negro politics to explain what, what I'm talking about. I thought Negro meant undue suffering or pain. It actually means a fascination with corpses, yeah. with cemeteries. But when you act them, when, when I go to developing countries and talk about people's expectations, you can see that the expectation of morbidity and mortality is is quite different from ours. The people have accepted, or not accepted, but they have experienced uh, disease, violence, early death, um, as part of as part of policies in which the which we as uh, great arms traders look at. The, if you look at the arms trade in America and um, uh, uh, and Britain, and now we want to move from. We want to be the tenth best arms trader. It's all part of this fascination with violence. But the major point I want to make, um, I'm not going to say the word final again, uh, Pat, because it's a typical academic technique. You know, if an academic says finally, and then 20 minutes later they're still saying finally. <laughs> um, I, I want to come back to the importance of the terminology of the language we're going to use to be to spread the enthusiasm about an alternative way of thinking and living. That's almost more important than because otherwise you can't see the wood for the trees. If we get if we just think it's about job keeper and, and job seeker and, and all sorts of other the accumulation of subsidies, that's not going to give us that's, we won't still won't know whether it's a giraffe or a jet plane. And I come, look, I, my cop-out always is to refer to poets because they often have a multi-dimensional view that escapes us in prose. There's a wonderful pacifist American poet called William Stafford who, who wrote a poem called Great Men Distracted. And he says, that sometimes commanders take us over and they try to proceed by, uh, they try to impose their whole universe how to proceed by daily calculation. I can't eat that bread, is what he said. And Bertolt Brecht, the wonderful German poet, playwright, opposer of fascism and totalitarianism, uh, responded with a poem called The Bread of the People. And he said that in response to Stafford, um, uh, justice is the bread of the people. And, and just as daily bread is necessary, so is daily justice. It is even necessary several times a day. And finally, that's it. Thank you. One of the issues that I thought about uh, in terms of this meeting we're having today, and I've, I've hit this nail on the head, and I'm not getting anywhere with it. The issue is accountability. I, it's just amazing what's happened to our world. When you look at the bank on the internet, I can't find out who the managers are, who the board are, or anything. I'm talking Westpac. When I look at IINet, I can't find out who owns it and where it goes. And when you look at the federal government doing the same thing, it's hard to find people accountable unless it's something that they've done good and they want to take credit for. I think that's one of the key issues 
that really bothers me and why I think something's bound to happen to bring us back to earth and our feet on solid ground. What do you think? Yeah, I, look, um, most people every day of their lives if, uh, are, are knocking on the doors of bureaucracies of some kind, trying to find, let, I mean, let, and you don't have to be one of the 10,000 people wandering around Sydney or bridging business. What I, what I should have added was that I think most of, and this would, I heard today a talk about you know tracing and tracking people who are infected. And the, the epidemiologist was saying, this can only be done locally. If you want to hold people accountable, if you want to see what is going on, is you, you've got to have a local base for it. And my view about the, the alternative way of thinking and living is that most of basic uh, human needs for food and shelter and education and uh, healthcare and transport could be achieved outside the market and um, uh, locally. That doesn't mean to say we don't think nationally and internationally, but that would make accountability because of the visibility locally um, more feasible. Yeah, I had an interesting experience yesterday with a bloke I've known for a long time who's an ex-refugee who's got himself up in a plastic company who answered the government's call to produce face shields. Um, you know, he, he got flummoxed because he can't find any government authority that all he can give him to. And so I, he said, can you, can you help me? So I, I rang um, the National Coronavirus uh, Hotline. And I went, oh, no, we don't know, we don't do that. And I rang three politicians in a different part of the country. That's a bloody good question. I don't know who does that. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of, I take your point, it goes to Stuart's thing about the fact that often this is so remote from where real, where real lives are lived. And of course, the, the focus of the people in the bank and at IO and it is how they can compete with people in, in their sector to get more profit. Um, in the same way, you know, like I said before, the bank manager says to me, Mr. Gwendemi, got some great products to, to sell you. And it was a heavy for his hand further down my trying to renegotiate a mortgage, you know. So the, the human's out of the picture, so I'll, it's not surprising there's no accountability. There's an old Catholic notion of subsidiarity. So no religion here. That's right, right. Yeah. it's a small suit. But it basically says that, you know, the decisions need to be made at the level where they're going to have the biggest impact on the people and where the people who are the most affected by it can participate in that. In an Aboriginal wise moment up in Northern Australia, the, the adage is nothing about us without us. And yet in this system, everything about us is without us. And you just pointed to it. So when even our politicians can't tell us how the national stockpile operates at a time of a pandemic, it seems that we need to find another way. I, I can't resist an anecdote. I mean, the, I was in the Philippines when the COVID-19 was just breaking out. And I, before I got on the plane here, I rang up the COVID hotline and said, you know, do I, do I need to get a test? And they said, where are you going? I said, go to the Philippines and uh, going to, I'll be in Manila. And the lady and the, the person said, I'm sorry, where, where is that? Which, which country is that in? So... <laughs> Right, thanks, um, Phil and Stuart. I've been coming along to these nights for a couple of months now, and I'm, I'm constantly impressed by you know the, the wisdom and, and intellect of the speakers um, um, each time. And, and once again, um, it's been a really inspiring sort of discussion uh, from you both. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit about my experience um, that sort of pertains to um, what you've sort of talked about, and I think I'm potentially living that. So the dream of being a part of a, a socially independent um, society, interdependent society, and that for the first time as a young person since I moved to Sydney, I was able to work part-time. 
and then that's what then allowed me finally to really have the energy and time to invest in activism, get more involved in the community, um, and, and sort of volunteer and, and things like that, which before I think being a slave to the workforce, sort of working a, you know, a 10, 11 hour day, uh, and sort of just not having the energy to do much more, I'm feeling so much more um, sort of fulfilled now um, in my life and feel like I'm actually really contributing more. Um, it's interesting that people, when they've seen me being involved in activism, that they've sort of asked me whether I do have a job because I am sort of, you know, um, seen on social media on multiple weekdays and, and things like that. And it's just sort of, it's a bit saddening to see that, my, you know, a lot of my peers are still stuck in that sort of that cycle of, you know, that being a slave to the work week and being focused on materialistic goals and things like that, that, you know, that's where potentially their, you know, their aspirations lie. Then when I went to a socialism conference um, last year, um, what I felt, you know, I, while I sort of strongly aligned with their views, what I felt was missing was a clear pathway of where we go. There was this constant rhetoric of we've got to tear this system down and rebuild it. Um, you know, we, you know, we've got to sort of... The, redistribute the power, production, all those things that you alluded to, but there was no real mention of what the pathway was. And, you know, I've been involved with a few different protest movements over the last 12 months, and it just seems like we're the same people moving from one sort of issue to another, but we sort of don't really... It wasn't clear to me as well, how do we actually sort of reform the broader system. So I was wondering, you know, I know you mentioned, Stuart, you didn't want to necessarily get into the nitty-gritty of, of policy, um, but... I don't know if you would indulge us, Phil and Stuart, in terms of what is sort of a realistic pathway to, for us to achieve the, the meaningful change that we need and maybe what, what are some of the broader structural reforms that we actually need to be focusing on, on pushing? That's a great, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, this dilemma uh, characterised the early days of the Australian Labour Party. If you look at the discussions that went on in Melbourne in the late, latter part of the 19th century, um, it was, you know, it was all about those kind of dilemmas. But in terms of the present day, my, my experience, uh, beware authoritarianism and bullying is as bad on the left as it is on the right. So the abusive use of power is, is something you have to resist everywhere. My, my experience with social movements, um, which I've been involved in, is uh, you have to have small victories in order to get up on a Monday morning. Um, and I'll, one step forward, two steps back. But you have to conceptualize what it is you, you're trying to do. The idea, uh, and those small, those small victories involve d dialogue. You have to go and talk to people. When, I mean, when we created the Sydney Peace Foundation years ago, almost 25 years ago now, what, what happened was a, a few of us realised that kind of all the beautiful people who were in this room got a warm inner glow from talking to one another, but 51% but, but of the decisions were made, being made by multinationals in the high rises. So I made it a point of starting to go to talk to CEOs of, of the big corporations. And then I discovered that one or two of them wanted to talk to me. They wanted to talk to me about their Down syndrome child. They didn't want to talk about, you know, <laughs> screwing the public, which is what the stereotype image was. So there was a kind of, you know, the personal is the political. It, it stared me in all those sorts of experiences, and and uh, we we eventually formed alliances with them, except over one issue, and that was the treatment of the Palestinians. But that's another issue. But small victories, constant dialogue. Um, you know, if you're going to climb Everest, you can only climb one mountain at a time. You can't climb the whole of the Himalayas. So when I hear about tearing down the structures and building building a new reform, it looks to be like climbing all the Himalayas all at once. Yeah, and, and part of that, though, I think, is that dialogue with those who you often you most disagree with. Uh, 
um, I, I found the early years of doing this sort of work to turn up to give a talk somewhere and I was speaking to the different same same group of people wearing different clothes. Mm. You know, the social justice mob, you know, which is great. Um, but the do need to dialogue with those who most disagree and find a way to do that becomes fundamentally important. And in the initial stages, you're gonna get belted up and abused. You know, and but my, my theory there is don't be disheartened by that because if you're over the target, you're going to get some flack. Um, not to use a military term, but mm. you get my point. Like you, 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 in the engagement, there's going to be some push and some pull, but it's no good us sitting outside the window chucking rocks at it. We've got a, a that's, that's a classic example of stewards said there. I find that too. We set up a, a, a business e ethics project many years ago because when we set up Antar, we had we had all the the social justice people, the human rights people, the environmental people, the ones we didn't have were the business people, and the miners. And so we set up a thing called Rural Land Development for Coexistence and Mining Support Groups. And when we got to meet and talk to them, they wanted to talk about their kids' education and how they worry about their kids' futures and things like that. It was a, you can find a point of commonality. Um, and again, many years ago, we were part of the Northern Island Peace Process of taking young people from here and Aboriginal leaders into the discussions in Belfast and Cremona and uh, Derry, and we would we would get and basically it was John Hume's idea. John Hume mentioned to a colleague of ours in Ireland that you know, the trouble with the, this peacemaking process at a time of the troubles is that the decisions are going to be made and the agreements will be reached by politicians and extremists, and it's going to have to be lived out by the local people. And so, the, that, but those local people, particularly the younger people, are going to have to learn the skills to make that happen. And I think in our movements here, we have to have the skills to enable us to build that better world. It's, it's not just an aspiration, you're going to be skilled up for it. And that's about dialogue, it's about conflict resolution, it's about never giving up, and it's about small victories on the way there. You know, I gave a few loose examples about people's movements. There's a, the work of David Corton, the academic in, in the United States, talks about where change comes from. And it, you know, it, a lot of NGOs get caught up, we're going to have a project, we're going to have a campaign. Where it actually it comes from sustainable, long-term buildings of coalitions amongst not always the usual suspects. And so you look at the women's movement, the peace movement, the anti-nuclear movement, the environmental movement, where all the big shifts have come. They're characterised by people forming loose and shifting coalitions around values they come to share. And so if you, and that's why the language is so important, because if you if you strip back the language that people use, you reveal the assumptions they make when they make decisions. If you strip back the assumptions, you reveal the values. So you, there, is, there needs to be a revolutionary change of our language and that's got to be encourage others into dialogue and relationship. Um, and, but you've got to do it in an organised way that you're not doing it on your own. You know? And there is a cause, I'm looking at Stephen Langford, for the, for the noble pointy ended protest that brings attention to the issue that people can get behind. And, the, and not to, and to believe that change is going to happen. The change, the change does happen. You know? we, we can't sort of go on that. But the direction it's going to happen depends on what we do, how organised we are. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bill and Stuart. Um, wow, this is an ongoing, this is definitely an ongoing discussion. Um, okay, I just wanted to quickly follow on from the previous uh, question about we, we're on, we're on a, long, a long road of history. And I, I, with all the discussion about terminology and so on, I just feel like, I don't know, we're living Karl Marx's theory. You know, we went through a series, we went through slavery, we went through feudalism, we went and now we're in capitalism and we have no other option but to pose in whatever formula, formulation language you like is socialism. You could call it organised human rights or you could call, call it a lot of different things. But there's, there's really no other option. We, capitalism is now under COVID is functioning as it 
is expected to, and as it, as it is structurally um, set up to do. I don't know if people have seen on Facebook the anti-social media um, of that, um, that uh, graph that comes up with me several times, and it shows you how much money the richest people in the world have made during COVID. Jeff Bezos has made a hundred billion. Um, uh, Gates, all the rest of them, it's got the top ten. It shows you how much they've made in the last six months. It's incredible. It's it's a blessing for them. So, um, you know, the thing is, we have got to harness the all the different aspects of the crisis, the social crisis, and this particular terrible COVID crisis, and somehow bring people together. Uh, around a common goal, because as Stuart pointed out, power is the question. If you took an opinion poll of Australians or of the world, we would and things were implemented democratically, then we would have socialism already, because that's what people think. If you look at all the opinion polls, but the power is in the hands of this tiny one percent. So, in the end, despite all the other things, and it's fantastic, we're building coalitions, which I call rebellions. We've got fantastic rebellions going on, Black Lives Matter and so on. We need a revolution. Because if we don't take the power out of that tiny group, expressed in Australia by the COVID Commission, by the way, if we don't take the power out of that group, um, we will continue to have to bash our head against you know, the, this, this power structure. So in the end, the question of power, as Stuart said, I think is, is critical. We have to get ourselves all together, all these different groups, all these movements, and somehow take the power out of those, those hands. Yeah. Look, uh, I like what you said, but um, you did say there's no alternative, and the other person who said there was no alternative was Margaret Thatcher. Now, I, I, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, dialogue, uh, the overture, if you start with the overture, there's no alternative. You could, you probably lose um, all the people who don't read Green, read green Left. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm much more cunning. You are much more honest than me, Jim. I'm much more cunning <laughs> in terms of, of, of what I've tried to, to build. And look, the cue, I think the cue comes, came from George Orwell at the, at the beginning of the Second World War. He argued that most people didn't have a clue what was going on. He said he could walk into a pub and, and, and people did not know what was going on. Admitted, and still I think that's, that is the case. We, we, we may take for granted in this place um, that rationality and dialogue is, um, it is a quality, a, um, a, a part of the chemistry of everybody. That ain't so. That, that, that is that the, the, the notion that even having a conversation about these issues is quite unusual because everybody's in such a rush and, and there's, there's one feature of power that we didn't mention and, and that concerns the dominance of the, of the technical of, of, of Facebook and, uh, and Twitter and so on uh, because human rights doesn't mean anything to the, to the power of those companies and yet they have an anaesthetic uh, almost intoxicating effect on large numbers of people. Um, there's no alternative. <laughs> it, it's interesting, you know, that, I mean, the power group thing is absolutely vital. Right? It's absolutely vital. And with the, going back to that Northern Ireland experience, as Olga Hadman is a very wise and wonderful Indigenous leader from uh, Darwin, was part of the delegation. And she got up in, in Belfast, the town hall, this big conference. How will we know when we are reconciled? And she took she laid out a five point plan. You know, it's got to be acknowledgement of the Aboriginal people and who did you acknowledge here? There's got to be recognition of the unique work rights that pertain to people here because of that acknowledgement. There needs to be negotiations in good faith. You know, we say, oh, yes, yes. There needs to be a commitment to social justice, which is formal but also substantive. There's, there's got to be a fundamental change in power relations. The uh, DUP mayor at the time probably fell off the stage, you know. But that's it, that's the bomb, because often we can dress this up with flowery stuff, but at the end of the day, how we know the shift will happen? Because there's a change in power. The power relations will shift. How you get there, I'm a bit in the stewards camp, I think you 
we've actually got a, um, and my Irish mate says, we must let them have our way. <laughs> but we can't, you, you, it, 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 if we start not from that position, you start admission that I'm, I've got the answers and you're wrong, well then that's like trying to talk Greek to the Turks. We've got to find a common way of doing it. And that's, that's the long, hard slot. If she was here, uh, she'd have something different to say. But, but, uh, <laughs> no one is a hero to their butler or something. Did someone say that? She's not my butler, but you know. No one's a prophet in their own country. That's not that, that, well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. But um, well, my wife gave me something which I sort of ignored or mocked or something at first, but now I think she's probably got the point. I can't remember where it was from. It's that our, our way of communication is wrong. We don't really know each other very well. So we have like Facebook, well, I don't have it, but like people do, and, and uh, lots of friends, so called, on that. And then on the other hand, you have sort of trying intimacy of like getting to people's personal lives on television, stuff like that. But we don't get to know each other. Our dreams, what was it? There was, a, there was an article dreams, our hopes, our, uh, what motivates us. We don't really know that. We don't really have those conversations. I mean, I've got a friend called David Grovix, and he smokes a lot of um, marijuana and, and hangs out with people a lot. Apparently, that's quite a good way of doing it. I haven't tried that. I like alcohol. But, um, yeah, there's something about it. There's, uh, there's something there that we... I don't want to shift it just into that this sort of area, but there's something in that that we don't... Um, when I was um, listening to uh, people... Been saying why they joined the ANC when they were 14, 15, 16 years old and they've been with it their whole lives. Why did you first go to the ANC? Why did you become involved in the anti apartheid movement? They said they had the best parties. And, and, and I think there's something in that too. I, I think we need to. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know why people, when we're se se selling the Green Left Weekly, why they walk straight past us. 99.5% of people walk straight past us. And, and Jim doesn't, is, is wonderful, he doesn't seem phased by that. But I always do, because the alternative is so, is so rubbish, it's so shy. To have the telegraph, who wants to read that? And it's even seeing, don't they want to, haven't they got an appetite for something a bit better than that? Even more, more interesting. But they don't, somehow we've been trained not to want what we probably need. I don't know why that is. And it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, sorry, the whole of life is just a big puzzle to me, so that's my question. <laughs> Well, answer the puzzle. <laughs> well, no, always with you, Stephen, but the answer's in your question. It's about, it's about friendship, it's about intimacy. I mean, let me make a comment. I mean, I'm in the middle of a controversy at the moment with, a, with another university, even though I'm, you know, I'm too old to work in a university. It's about the, the supervision of a doctoral student. And my view of supervision, it doesn't have English as a first language. My view of supervising students was that I needed to know where they lived, whether they had any money, whether they, whether they got a square meal a day, um, uh, whether they were a thousand miles away from home or, or living with their parents, whether, they're, whether the, the, the limp that I saw them walking with down the corridor related to something that was temporary or permanent. I needed to know about that human being. I didn't expect to be able to help them and teach them anything unless I knew about the, them, them personally. And, and, and that reciprocity is absolutely crucial to policy. I mean, I learned that from the great architect of the British National Health Service, a guy, a professor at the London School of Economics who talked about the gift relationship. The gift relationship was, was was friendship or given to somebody without expectation of reward. That's what universal health insurance is. That's why the, the capitalists don't like it. So that, and, and of course it's, it, that spirit, which in, in, when I first joined Sydney University, it used to be called collegiality, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? It didn't, it. There was no such thing as the human resources division. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, they were thrilled to bits when I resigned because I was such a thorn in their side. I used to mock the whole notion of human resources because it was all about ticking, ticking boxes. 
But I dealt, I'll tell you what I did do, I dealt with the issue of power in that respect, and I got myself elected as, as a staff representative of the Senate, so I knew, I knew where the money was. Um, so, you, so I had to, but, but the reciprocity thing, the, the personal is the political, the, you know, I say to me, I tell you what, it's good for your health, mentally and physically, that's why you should do it. It also makes life much more interesting. Sorry, it was no, a long answer. Good. <laughs> good. I think a couple of things I'd suggest. I mean, relationships were the key to that Northern Ireland work we did, right? I mean, once you got to know someone, because some of these young people would start with, I've got to kill Sammy. I've got to my culture. You know, I'll, I'll talk to kill you. you know, that, was, that was how the discussion would start. Right. And then, in the end, you know, after a couple of days, we'd have a square to dance and turn the music up. And um, a lot of this work was based on that TV show, The Eagle. And, um, and once they got people to know each other, it, it changed. And when we brought Aboriginal people, they were, I mean, you weren't just eyeballing each other, but was, you, could, you could look at the same thing differently. The whole, you know, the Carpe Diem thing in the movie, you go and stand on the table and look at the same thing from a different perspective to get people to do that. But in terms of people walking past, the, the, not buying this wonderful newspaper, um, a lot of people live quiet lives of suburban disappointment. They walk around with their bags. They probably wouldn't even see the person. You know, and it's a, it's a fundamental, back to what I said in the opening remark, we've got to restore humanity. And, you know, stand on the high moral ground of that stuff, Steve, but don't surrender it. You know, you feel sorry for those people if they're in that situation. That they're, you know, but because if we can get the humanity back in the picture, then it's going to be a lot easier to resolve. And I remember years ago being you know, working in El Salvador, and I used to use a, 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 an old quote from the Sandinistas about how we can sort of rise above it. You know, and there was a poem they had. They used to call it "Me, Me, Venganza Personal," my personal revenge. Venganza, Venganza Personal. It was like something along the lines of, you know, when this is all over, I will give you back these streets without beggars or homeless. I will give you back this town without poor and despaired people. But I'll also give you back these hands that you so mistreated in torture but failed to take away their tenderness. You know, there's, there's, we've got to rise above. Yeah. 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 Mahmoud Darwish, brilliant the national poet of the Palestinians, talked about what a homeland would look, what the identity of Palestinians in their homeland would look like. And he said it should look like the occasion when the religious thought police don't beat up the prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> that would be inspiring. I'll ask a question, uh, and uh, I, I feel that I don't think capitalism is dying, but it's evolving into mutating into a different form. And among them, I see a new school of thought. Well, not really new, but a modified school of thought of modern monetary theory that says, oh, we absolutely can print money so that we meet everyone's needs, including a bailout. There's no bailout so big that the government can give, can uh, help. But at the same time, the government can always print money to address poverty. And there are pockets such as that. And uh, it's also it's also ignoring certain problems that they have that the capitalist system has, and it, but they successfully hide it, like the one point four quadrillion derivatives market that's absolutely shaky. Uh, and I think we're being made to look at the wrong place. They can understand our language, believe me. They can speak like a leftist. In fact, Frank will say, will, will, it, will admit that one of the biggest uh, hunting grounds for the right-wing think tanks is the political economy students from Sydney. You see, 100%. <laughs> and where have they gone? They understand us, but we don't understand them. Or they make us think we understand them. Only to the extent that they want us to understand them. Yeah, sure. And the funny thing also is the same cards are being played on them by the Chinese. The Chinese understands the Western 
economic textbooks in and out. But how many of us have really read their economic textbooks or the Japanese? And that's the big, uh, that's a big question I'm gonna ask. How will we be able to know their playbook and they know our playbook inside out? Should, should ask Frank. Yeah. Look, I, I, the idea that something is on the way out, I mean, there's no, uh, the only example I can think of, in, you know, the, which becomes before and after is something like the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, perhaps. But if we think, uh, if we think uh, about a way of living and thinking in which economy is not the, the only pre preoccupation. Can you imagine a society in which that occurs? I mean, I talk to my son, he always wants to talk to me about his mortgage. And I want to know whether his kids are happy and, and whether he and his wife are healthy. Um, and whether their community is reasonably supportive. Because on your deathbed, did you, do you say, I wish I'd got rid of the mortgage a bit quicker? Or do you say, do you ever say, I wish I'd spent more time in the office? So I, I'm not trivializing it, I'm going back to the person who's the political. You have to say, well, what? Now suddenly we're concerned that people can't even say goodbye to their parents when they die. So um, what's that got to do with economics? Um, everything. So I, I, I think I want to always oversimplify it. I can't, you know, handle complex equations. I think if we if we think about this, a way of living that's not preoccupied with economy, you know, when we run a sailing club down the down the coast, and I all told tell people it's the last example of socialism in the southern hemisphere. And people come along and say, "Well, who owns the boats?" I said, "What do you mean, who owns the boats? We all do. Nobody does, and we all do." And slowly, that way of thinking has permeated the Shalhaven Council. Right. I could go. I could. I could. Right. I, I should stop at that point. Socialism so, by stealth. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah I, mean, I guess maybe there's an opportunity now. I'm not, not going to pretend I can answer your question, but the, the, the pandemics in history have always changed the societies in which they're set. I mean, the Black Plague or the contributed to the end of feudalism and to the rise of what came, came next. There's, the, 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 we don't know what the world is going to look like over this, right? Um, so there could be an opportunity um, for a new normal. Uh, swinging back to just what's the usual, which is what you're saying, got us into this mess in the first place. Which means, therefore, it is not sustainable. Like they're, they're, the language you refer to and the fact that you know the Nasdaq goes up on the TV news every night with the all the Sydney all the indexes and they just wash over people. You they mean you don't understand what it's about? No, I don't. I'm waiting for the weather. <laughs> I'm waiting for the weather. <laughs> I want to know it's going to bottle raining tomorrow. Um, but the um, but my, my point my point is that, that that's not going to win because if, if that is continuing to be sustained, then. But, then the world's going to go to hell in a handcuff because climate change is coming us in a way that you've got to be dealt with and it can't be dealt with by the markets and the people that use that language. Um, there are windows and opportunities, but you know, that could be my point. You know. I don't know what Thanks, Matt. Look, in response to that last question, we have a huge obligation not to be cruel to future generations. 
so we can take the cue from from them, from the people involved in the Extinction Rebellion and uh, Save the Planet. Yeah, it it, it, um, it also that that language has to be grafted onto um, aspirations that make people feel optimistic. I mean, one of the dangers is the the assumption that once you leave school. Um, you, the only way to survive is to be able to master the internet, to be able to be, because if you listen to the language of the future, it's about, we need people in IT, we'll import anybody from any country in the world who's conversant with IT. Um, that's, uh, that's quite dangerous, it's as, it's as illusory as saying that if we discover a vaccine, all will be well, but I, I think your optimism about um, young people uh, concerned with the protection of the, of the planet is, is crucial. Yeah, and it, it, it brings up the point that the, 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 the reality in places that are at the front line of this, like Kiribati and Tavala, where we spend a lot of time, um, it just can't be, you know, it's, it's like a, it's an absolute omnipresent multiplier effect of everything else. Climate change doesn't, uh, you know, is not the, the only thing happening. There's a lot of poverty in those places, but the Climate change makes all those things worse. You know, at high tide in Tavala, the water comes inland about 100 metres under the earth and bubbles up and little springs come up to salt water. Now, the ABC, even in the last week, had um, entertained a, 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 an academic from Canada who wanted to say that, oh, but these islands, the water comes and redeposits sand in other places and they're growing the islands. What he didn't say, of course, is when you move sand from one place to another, it's got to be taking it from somewhere else. Um, the young people out in Kiribati and Tavalu, they're, they're leading the charge on this, uh, which, are, which is ins inspiring, and they're inspired by Greta Thunberg, but she, yeah. there's a movement of young people on this that's very, very heartening. And I think, it, thank you for raising it. Frank. I want to thank you, of course, for both of you making some thoughtful observations that have triggered this, this conversation. Um, I want to add two things, and I promise I will finish with a question, if it's only, do you agree? Um, <laughs> 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 I'd like to say, beware of academics who say finally, and uh, beware of questioners who say uh, what yeah. they think rather than what they want to know. What I think is that there's two tensions here. One is uh, about uh, economy and society, and you've both been very eloquent about the need to recognise social values and not let everything be dominated by an economic discourse. I mean, this is powerful stuff, and I think it has strong resonance everywhere. But it sets me wondering, why is it that the economic discourse has been so dominant? In, in, in what sense is capitalism to blame? The promise was always with capitalism that there'll be economic growth that would eradicate poverty and enable us to have more free time, more fulfilling lives to do all the social stuff, the interconnectedness, the, 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 the nice things about life. Um, but it hasn't happened. And uh, you know, people are on a sort of a treadmill, other than for a tiny elite that's got more money in it than, than it knows what to do. So that, I think, is the enigma, but that put, pretty clearly puts capitalism in the spot. There's something about capitalism that prioritises the economic over the social, as well as, of course, prioritising the interests of a powerful elite over the majority. But the second element is more problematic. This is the tension, I think, between uh, state and society. Now, and, and this is, I think, problematic for socialists and all those who are anti-capitalist in some form sense. That you've referred to the need for bottom-up politics and celebrating NGOs and social movements around feminism, environmentalism, as wonderful school kids coming out on the marches uh, for climate change activism. All this is marvellous stuff. Yet still we live in a society where what the state does matters an awful lot. And 
I, I find myself in this dilemma, you're sort of partly celebrating the role that the state has played during this COVID crisis because it's acted in a sort of semi-socialist sort of way, but only in the sense of socialism as extensions of the state in provision of services or in regulation of the society. So when I hear about, you know, job seeker, job keeper, etc., yes, I'm in favour of extending it, not rolling it back, because it seems to me this is an appropriately state socialist response to a health crisis, you know, to extend the state. Yet that sort of sits a bit awkwardly with the sort of bottom-up view of socialism. It says, no, it's, it's people's struggles and social movements that are going to bring about progress. So I'll put it back to you. Should we support these extensions of the state that have been brought on by the COVID crisis? Or should we say, no, that's a bureaucratic form of socialism or we'll lead to a sort of an oppressive society? And, and we really want to get back to a more sort of liberationist uh, ethos rather than a regulation. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, yes, Frank. Okay. Um, look, uh, res response to the first tension is uh, takes me to Galbraith's notion that the the that was an economist who would desperately search for a philosophy that would justify selfishness. In other words, the fascination with greed, with accumulation, and you get that night after night. I mean, I, uh, not just with the you know, reports about the stock market, but about um, your reports on property sales. Um, the second issue about the, the state is about uh, who sits in the, uh, the bureaucratization. This comes back to my, my concern about the language, the philosophy, and the practice of nonviolence. When I've gone into the Department of Home Affairs here to, to find out who's sitting on papers for, for people who've been hanging around for years waiting to have their, for their applications, I find enormous fear, in, in fear, um, arbitrary use of power by Pizzullo, that, that Svengali chief secretary, and Dutton, his, his, his partner in crime. So that, and that occurs in every, every feature of the state, as well as in the response of non-state actors. This, this, so it's no, it's no surprise that there's an epidemic of, non, of, of domestic violence, because, that, because there's a massive illiteracy. You can't have a, an organization, of, whether it's called state or not, if there's a massive illiteracy about non-violence. If it's about shoving, I mean, that's, I mean, I think I've said enough, otherwise it's a topic for another day. <laughs> we'll, be a, we'll be a form of violence to talk. <laughs> uh, th thanks, Frank, that was really good. I, I've, you reminded me that in the first part of your, your, your comment of a, a, a cab driver I met in Melbourne a number of years ago who, uh, who was moaning about the fact that uh, the... Um, a very rich billionaire who committed suicide jumping off the top of his incomplete tower. Um, they had billions and billions of dollars. And this, this taxi driver said, I don't know. He said, in Greece, a man wins a million dollars, he retires, he goes home, he plays cards with his friends, he makes love to his wife in the afternoon, he thinks lots of bricks in he enjoys his life. He said, in Australia, a man makes a million dollars, you know what he wants to do? He wants to make another million dollars. <laughs> um, so there's that sort of uh, this connect from what purpose of, of, of uh, you know, the wealth might be. The second part, I'm not sure that they'd be mutually exclusive um, in that I think the, the, the state action here, job keeper, job seeker, which is sort of socialist in its bent, didn't happen because the state woke up one day and went, oh, I think we should go socialist. I think it happened because the Australian people rose up and were screaming. And there were queues of people out the front of Centrelink, and, the polit and I know politicians' offices were getting besieged with phone calls and abuse and real life cases and hardship. Um, it's a, it, which reminded me many years ago, uh, again, not running, I'm sorry, but you remember when the big tsunamis hit Asia? 
and there was a there was a big fundraiser at the MCG, and people were throwing there were hundred thousand people turned up and they were throwing money in. They raised a lot of money for, for the for the Asian tsunami. John Howard is in the middle of the oval with Tim Costello. And Howard turns to Costello and he says, Wow, look at this. Who would have thought Australians would be this generous to Asians? And Costello turned to see, I thought at that moment, he said, I thought, you know, here's, here's the Prime Minister, and he said, These are my people. I am their leader. I must follow them. That's what's happened, I think, in the government's initial response to this. Whether they will continue to hear that depends on whether the people continue to raise what they need in a way that politicians will hear it, I think. I, I just, uh, one of my difficulties comes about this, uh, what you've talked about, Frank, comes back to uh, Joe's point about accountability. Over the maltreatment of Shokat Mosulman, largely by, or partly by the New South Wales branch of the ALP, I cannot get a response from Labour members in support of their colleague. They are scared stiff of the Daily Telegraph, yep. of, uh, of, of um, not Fox News, what do you call it, Sky News. Right, yeah. Sky News. Right, right. So the, the, the fear, um, I mean, I saw a comment the other day that uh, Albanese is now invisible. Um, so the, the, the business of articulating what the alternative is, and that you need a bit of courage to stand up for principle. I've said to them, when I go to Canberra, look, why don't you do it? Because it's quite good for your health. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, 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 to run your life like that, yeah. to see which way the wind is blowing is... is um, Precisely. Yeah. So but, and, and because it's a vacuum at the moment, isn't it? It's a vacuum and people are looking for that. They're looking for leadership. And what we've got at the moment is followership. I'm told uh, from reliable sources within the ALP that at the moment the dominant posture is focused on values uh, definition and on uh, winning over the persuadable movement. In other words, the yeah, yeah. party's policies, you know, led by Albanese, one of our former students at Sydney University. <laughs> It, it, it's, it's just positioning itself in the wings so that keeping the spotlight on the government you know, means that they will then, as the election comes closer, be able to offer an alternative. Now, it seems to me it's a terribly missed opportunity. No, no, yeah, to, yeah. I, I mean, values are important, of course, but so are so, so policies and a program and unless they actually offer something, uh, it, it, it doesn't provide a focus for all the dissident people who are looking for an alternative way well, they're, not, they're not even any good at values. I mean, they're scared to, stiff of saying anything in defence of Julian Assange, yeah. for example. I, I, I have some personal links with Alba, I might say, and I, I, mean, I sent him something I'd written about the Green New Deal that I was speaking about yeah. in that previous session of Politics in the Pub. He was Personally, sent a polite reply, not, not just a formal letter through his office, but a personal response saying, thanks very much, this is so uh, good to get your thoughts. Uh, the party is considering its uh, policies for the future. Not very inspiring. But, you know, uh, understandable in the context of what political that they're electoral machines and, and they're not concerned with providing sort of rallying points for, for activists. In fact, the fact that the labelling of what I've written, Green New Deal, was a signal to handle yeah. with care yeah. because it, it looks like something that's come from a rival political yeah. party. Yeah. A, a party that in Albo's own yeah. seat has, has threatened to knock him off in the past. Yeah. Uh, so. Th th these are the real politics of the state, yeah, sure. and, and that's why, even though as in the British socialist tradition that Stuart and I grew up in, uh, socialism is seen as state provision, 
the, the beverage type principles that you referred to, an element of the gift economy, even embedded in that way of thinking. It, it, it has to be delivered through a, a state apparatus, through political parties of the centre left mm. that have basically vacated the territory. Sure. Yeah. And they've got there in the, the opportunity the dilemma. Dilemma. opportunity of the moment. Like if, if you had policies of the um, even if they come out and said, you know, the issues of childcare and aged care at the moment, and you took a lead run and said that basically we're going you know, the states because we're going to have free, free childcare and this country is no longer going to work, and we're going to take, you know, we're going to eventually sort of take a, the, get more involved with the running of aged care in a way that's not privatising it all over the country. I think they get landslide support. Yeah. yeah. Could we just see, did you want to say something, Stephen? Is there anyone else who wants, who hasn't asked a question yet? Maybe Stephen. Just a couple of things. It came to me what that article was about that Vivian gave me. It was that one of the key things that life is about meeting, not meetings. I sort of like that. I'm not very good at meeting, but meetings on, it worries me that I'm better at meetings than meetings. But anyway, life is about meeting. You're getting the replies from people, or you, you've got a reply from Albanese, and doesn't sometimes start an easy. I've been talking from the ABC, now there seems to be an agreement that they don't answer letters, that they just won't do it. And this is in stark contrast to like 20 years ago during the East Timor campaign. I remember you could hassle the ABC, and they would write back. And so we got a, a, a program about Michel Turner, who was yeah. like one of the yeah, yeah. heroes, yeah. and we got, and, and I don't know if it was because of us, but um, Albert, uh, Philip Adams actually went to East Timor at one stage, so it wasn't a closed book, but it is now. And you talk about collegiality, what, what I, I've written to them recently, a few people, is look, in the ABC, a few people I think had some smidgen of decency left. It's like East Timor, and what one of the Timorese said to us was, if there is no resistance within East Timor, there'll be fuck all outside East Timor. And it's the same with the, with the ABC. If there is no collegiality within the ABC and they're happy to be ridden over or they're thinking of their mortgages or something and they're not getting together within the ABC, the friends of the ABC, which are a bunch of them, I always call them pricks, but they, they, they're sort of a, a, they're a bit too enamored of the people in the ABC, I think, but there's some good people. But if there's no resistance within the ABC, there will be no resistance outside the ABC supporting them. And that's basically the rule that, that, that that's what will happen. And I just think that, you know, all of us have shown courage, I think, all of us in this room, Ingrid, Jim, Peter, um, well, I remember it, Stuart, <laughs> all of them, uh, Frank and, uh, and Joffrey, and Pat, what, uh, yeah. like, all sorts of heroes. I, and, and, what we need to remember is that a little bit of courage, in this climate, a little bit of courage goes a bloody long way, actually. And we should support the people at the, I'm just opposite the, I thought they might be here tonight. When, when we protest on Fridays for the, uh, for the refugees, for refugee rights, which is all our rights, there's the, on the other side of the steps, town hall steps, is the, um, the Free Assange group. And we should join them, because we're low in numbers. We need numbers. Which group? Yeah, the Julian Assange. The Julian Assange. The Julian Assange group. I'm not expecting you to come up from the coast, but like we do need people to do that, and that's where it starts. Like standing up for basic, as Chomsky says, based standing up for basic principles. We don't have to have a flipping blueprint of how it's, the new world is going to, going to be, although you actually said some great things this evening. We just have to stand up for basic principles, and that's where it starts. And it, and it seems piss weak, you know, standing up for. You know, a few of us for the refugees, but that's what we do. And it worries me that we don't, to be honest with you, the, the lack of solidarity among the solidarity groups. I don't understand that. I'm just sorry, I just don't. I just bloody well don't. The lack of solidarity among the solidarity groups. Sorry, I'll, 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 I'll make it I'll make it I'll just, you know. Thank you. Well, we're coming, we're coming towards the end of the evening. I'd like to thank both of our speakers. Um, I really think it's been a very interesting contribution from them and, and terrific audience.
audience participation as well. Um, I'd just like to say briefly that I think the, the tension that Frank raised at the end has been a theme throughout the whole discussion really, and that is how do you combine the grassroots resistance which is there to a lot of the things that um, are happening at the moment with some, you know, how do we build that into a social movement, which is what we've really been talking about. And I just want to say, personally, as one who works on international trade and mostly comes up against global corporations, that I do think we need to work out ways of having a more democratic state that's powerful enough to actually challenge the power of those corporations. Because, um, and, and combining that with local structures that actually build people's power. So you have to do all of those things, and it's a big challenge. But I do think that in the current triple crisis that we're in, the health crisis, the economic crisis, and the climate crisis, there are lots of opportunities to expose capitalism and to put forward those sorts of, not just alternative ideas and policies, but alternative ways of doing things. Um, so I really think we've canvassed a lot tonight. So thanks everybody participating.